Okay, let's start with a brief introduction to Julia or what is essentially a personal account of why I chose Julia for my research. So a little bit about myself. I have a bachelor's degree in, and a PhD in applied mathematics and I have a post, short postdoc, all of these things at Unicamp in Brazil. And, and then I joined the Federal University of Paraná as an adjunct professor. And during most of these years, uh, my PhD and then working as a professor, I researched uh, computational methods for nonlinear optimization. Uh, last year, I joined the Netherlands and Science Center, so I kind of left this research behind, except for my free time, which I still have some work on that. So in 2014, when I joined the university, I I started to look for which programming languages I would be using in the forthcoming years. Uh, during my time as a student, I, I used MATLAB for my classes. All the professors recommended MATLAB and also for testing algorithms. And, and I would like to move away from that. One reason being that MATLAB is proprietary, so I will have to put a financial burden on the students. And that was like... Uh, immediately a no-go uh, but of course there are other reasons just for the aspect of being not being open source was already annoying for me another thing that i was looking for was a language for my research uh, i use c++ for my phd and also a little bit before and unfortunately i do not find the language to be very uh, approachable especially if you're learning a new language and you want to do your, your PhD from the ground up using it, uh, it's not a great language to be using. You have many hidden things that you have to worry about. And most of my uh, colleagues were using C or Fortran, uh, still do actually, or in some cases you have people using Python when they don't have the requirement for speed. So I was looking to alternative for that as well. And well, of course, the language I chose for both of these tasks was Julia, actually. And the reasons I chose Julia are, are in the screen. There are essentially four pillars to, to say why I chose Julia for both teaching and for my research. And it's essentially that Julia is fast. Julia is friendly for mathematical things. Julia is easy to use and Julia has great integration. Here I'm thinking about lower level languages, but of course uh, also has integration with other languages. So what is Julia? Uh, Julia is a high level and high performance language. Uh, what I mean is that it is uh, very easy to understand Julia code, very easy to write Julia code. Uh, so that's the high level aspect of it. You don't have to declare variables before using it. You don't have to uh, declare types. Uh, it's easy, but it's also high performance in the sense that it's fast. And the way that Julia can be fast and high level is by using just-in-time compilation. So when you write your code and you execute, actually what is happening behind the scene is your code is being compiled and a compiled version of your code is being run. So the first time that you run your code, you have a pre-compilation time, uh, but the second time is actually faster. So you can see the speed of your code. Uh, Julia also has something called multiple dispatch, which I won't try to go into details, uh, but essentially is it's not object oriented. Julia has a lot of things like classes, but it does not have classes. So in 2010, Julia was uh, created, but actually was released to the public in 2012. And it came with a blog post stating why the authors created Julia. And it is a very greedy objective. Uh, you can see they, had, they wanted a lot of things. That's essentially a summary of the talk, all of these amazing things. And, and was one of the reasons many people tried Julia uh, at the time. And in many ways, they have succeeded. Uh, I won't go into details, but I recommend you read the blog post. It's still an interesting read today. In 2018, the first table release of Julia was made. And now in 2022, we have version 1.7 with 1 1.8 right around the corner. 
Okay, now going to why the reasons to, to choose Julia. First, Julia is free, accessible, easy to install, and easy to use. So I want to write code in Linux, which is my preferred uh, operating system, but I know most of my students use Windows, so I want the code to work on both. Uh, additionally, I'm competing in graphical interfaces, so I would like to have a language that has a good integrated development environment, and Julia had something a little bit different at the time. Now it has VS Code, which does a, a very good job, uh, also plugins for other languages. And I also wanted something like interactive notebooks for lecture notes or for, for uh, making some uh, examples in class. And Julia actually worked with Jupyter. It's part of the Jupyter uh, group or, or, or program. I don't know what you call it. Uh, the Jew in Jupyter is Julia. Uh, but also, more recently, you have Pluto, which you're going to hear more about in this webinar as well. Other interesting things that Julia has that makes it very easy to use are built-in environments like Virtual Env. It also has a built-in package manager, which makes it very easy to get packages registered. Uh, it is dynamically typed, so you don't have to declare the types of your variable, but it has type annotations. So if you actually want to constrain the types on a function, you can. You can be specific and it respects the type, which is great. Oh, another very important point is Julia is friendly for mathematical stuff. That means a lot of things, but specifically I'm looking at linear algebra here. I want to be able to say B equals A times X and understand both the mathematical and the computational meaning of it. Being, uh, it's amazing that it's the same thing, it's the same uh, uh, reading of the, of the code. So you can see a direct translation of it like MATLAB has. Uh, and so it's it's very good that I don't have to go uh, through great lengths to work with linear algebra. Another cool example, uh, this is the Grunschmidt orthogonalization process. Uh, here we have matrices and each column is a vector. This is a, a common uh, usage of matrices. Uh, specifically this line here, I have VK, which is here. VK minus the sum of the projection of VK onto AJ, pretty much what's written here, or J equals 1 to K minus 1, which is the sum part here. So it's very readable, very understandable for, for reworking with mathematics. Another cool thing is that Julia has Unicode characters. Uh, some people hate it. I particularly love it. Uh, one of the reasons people don't like it is that they say you actually you need uh, variables with meaning in their names and i argue that if you are in a mathematical field usually those symbols have meanings so if i'm working with optimization and i have a function f i say nabla f i and other researchers know that this is the gradient of f so this is actually very understandable the same for, for instance, for data science. If I, if I have y hat, it's clear this, this is the predicted value of y hat. So it's very cool that Julia has uh, Unicode characters, in my opinion. And you don't, you don't have this only for variables. You also have this for functions as well. So this, for instance, is just creating a function plus minus a b, which returns an interval a minus b, a plus b, just for fun, specifically in this case. So up until now, this, the, the both things that I show are very important for my classes. And that was already like a given that I will be trying Julia for a few classes at, uh, at least. Uh, but also my research, I would like to at least see if Julia is feasible uh, as a viable alternative. And one of the things that pushes Julia to research is that Julia is fast. So you can see here a traditional benchmark uh, where you compare Julia, uh, you compare many languages against the speed of C. And you can see Julia, along with other well-known uh, fast languages, are about the same speed of C, same order of magnitude. And you have the more traditional high-level languages being at least one order of magnitude 
is lower on average. So MATLAB, Python, R, and Octave, Octave in particular being much slower, which is the more traditional alternative to MATLAB. Uh, more recently, we did a blog post comparing uh, Julia and C++ and Python, uh, specifically called for, from inside Python. So this is reading a uh, known tabular data called from Python. And you have a pure Python implementation up top, which this is again compared to the speed of C++. So this is very slow, especially when files get bigger. Uh, and you have different Julia implementations here in this line and these two, which are kind of similar. And you have an optimized Julia version, which is this bottom one, which is actually faster than the C++ version. So this was very interesting for us to get to this point. But what I think it's most interesting is that actually, if you take some time to not do a terrible job, so this pre-alloc version here, you can get a decent version, like two, three times uh, slower than C++ at most, without a lot of work. So this pre-alloc version is essentially just pre-allocating the output vectors and, and, and looping over the, over the input. That's it. But if you really, really want to have a fast version, you can optimize and remain in Julia. And this is the pure Julia version optimized faster than C++. Another very important thing to me, uh, because of my research, was that the language that I chose had to integrate in some way with a Fortran package called Qtest. So Qtest is a benchmarking package for nonlinear optimization. It is maybe 30 years old, 30 years old, and it's one of those packages that if you really want to give a, like a full picture of your software, you want to compare using it. And I used it in the past and I wanted to keep using it, preferably without having to go through a, a lot of hoops. And I was very surprised to know that Julia had native integration with Fortran and no overhead for the cutest function. So up here you have the cutest uh, signature of the function ufn, and down here is the Julia call of the same function. So you have a pretty much pretty much the same thing. So cutest ufn is the name. It returns nothing. The four arguments have these four types here, and these four are the arguments themselves. That's it. That's all you need. Most of the work is actually in compile this, this code to make it available to Julia, which is what you're going to have to do anyway if you work with Fortran or C or whatever other language. Uh, so the Julia integration with it is extremely easy. Uh, as a side note, this is essentially what enabled my research for this last eight years. Uh, this organization, Julia Smooth Optimizers, is where we have all of the packages related to nonlinear optimization. My packages, not all Julia packages. Uh, we have about 40 packages. And one extra in interesting thing is in the same package manager that Julia already has natively, we can now ship Qtest, including the Fortran binary that we build and, and check your specific architecture to ship it along your, your code. So this is just a cute sidetrack. So in essence, what Julia did for me is that it solved the two languages problem. I can now prototype as easy as it will be with a language like MATLAB or Python. Julia is very high level, especially for linear algebra things, but also Julia is fast. So if I really want speed, I can keep iterating my code, keep uh, making it faster, like I would with C and Fortran. And usually you still already have a good speed uh, with your code without having to go through many uh, iterations. In some cases, you really can't go away from a lower level code. For instance, in our field, we still use many factorization packages. And this is a great thing that Julia allows you to call a native CF Fortran code without uh, overhead. 
And, but I specifically like this because if you're working, if you're a PhD student and you're going to be part of a group that has legacy code and they usually work using lower level languages because of that, actually you can use Julia with that group without having to disrupt anybody's work. So I'm going to make a small example of Julia right now. Not going to be very complicated. So opening Julia in my terminal, I have version 1.8 here. I, whenever I press these close brackets uh, uh, key, I enter package mode. In, in package mode, I can activate different environments. For instance, if I activate the experiments uh, folder, which is an environment, I can check what's in there with status. And I can see that I have installed measurements version 272 and I have a standardly package called statistics. If I activate dot, I activate this current environment. I, I have nothing probably. I can also activate a temporary environment, which is what I'm going to use right now. This temporary environment is empty. So here I can just say add and name of the package. And this adds the package that I want. This is being installed from uh, the general registry, the main registry of Julia. So this is automatic. I don't have to do anything separately. It's the, I think it's the first time I'm installing it in version 1.8 RC1. So you saw that it downloaded and precompiled 21 dependencies. Uh, this is gonna happen this time if I install again. In another environment, it's not going to install everything again, unless the versions change, of course. And that's it. It's installed. I can just say using forward diff. And now forward diff is loaded. So let's make a quick example. This is the traditional uh, Rosenbrock function. And if I say forward diff to gradient of this function, 0, 0. You're going to see the gradient being computed. The gradient at this point, 0, 0 is minus 2, 0. You saw that it took some time to give me the result because it was compiling this call, compiling the forward diff gradient call for this argument. So if I do the same thing, now I change the argument to 1, 1. You see it, it is faster, a lot faster, because it's already compiled. And you see that 0, 0 is, is because this is actually the solution of uh, minimizing f. Um, another example. So I'm going to create a function called square, which is squares a number, not very creative. And in this, with this function, I can square number two, for instance, the square of two is four. I can also square 2.0. So this is a different type. The first is integer. This is a float. So the result is 4.0. I can also square an imaginary number. The result is different. I can also square a matrix. So a square of A also works. Every time that I call the square function on a different type, it precompiles the code for that specific type. Uh, what's interesting here, I don't have to declare the type of the function square. Any x that has a, a, a power, a circumflex operator defined is going to work. For instance, the square of A is A. -A. Okay. However, I can constrain the type of the, the argument. So I can say square of a matrix is something else. So I can say, well, whenever I call the square of a matrix, actually what I want is to compute the square of each element. So when I proceed dot, uh, when I proceed something with a dot, uh, operator with a dot, is going to operate on each. So for each element, square it to, to square it. So as square eight, square A, sorry, you're going to see that is the square of each element of A. And if you use methods, you can see, well, not of A, of square. You can see which uh, versions of this function were defined. So for general X and for a X for a matrix. So this was my short showcase.
Okay, so what about now that I'm I'm working as a research software engineer at the Netherlands e Science Center? Uh, do I still recommend Julia? Is it still interesting for what we do at the center? And yes, as you expected, because I asked the question, Julia is very interesting for many of the things we do at the e Science Center. The e Science Center is very concerned about uh, fair software, about open science and reproducibility. And, and Julia is very friendly to some software best practices. Uh, it kind of forces you to follow some of them. So for instance, Julia, any environment is going to have a project.tumble in which you're going to have declared dependencies and you can add compatibilities so you can force uh, versions of some packages. And Julia uses semantic versioning for all registered packages, including your own if you try to register a package. Uh, additionally, you also have a manifest.tumble in your environment and this has all the installed packages. So if you make an experiment, you can ship these two files and you have full reproducibility of your environment. Uh, anyone can follow exactly what you had installed in your machine uh, in the Julia side of things. Um, also, Julia is very easy to register, uh, to register a package. So you have a semi-automated uh, process and a helpful bot to, so you can just go to GitHub and say like, add Julia registrator, uh, register, and that's it. Uh, have to, some time to wait and some hopes to go through to make sure that you don't, do, just don't register everything for the fun. Um, but it's very easy to get your software uh, on a registry. So this is also important for uh, for open science. Another cool thing that you can do is using a few packages like package templates to get a skeleton with a license and GitHub Actions for tests and GitHub Actions for documentation and Documenter, which generates documentation from doc strings and also markdown files and a website that together with GitHub Actions that you just created are going to generate uh, an online documentation for you with every new release that you make and every new push automatically. Also, you have Julia Formatter to format your code, which is always a good practice to follow some kind of formatting guidelines. Uh, it's useful to have, so just do it. So with these things and, and uh, a little bit of work with package templates and documenter. In five, 10 minutes, you have a package that you can push, make it a, a, put the documentation online with tests. And easily you have three of the five recommendations by, by default. And you can get the other two also very easily. Um, of course, not all is great at Julia land. There are some complaints uh, that the developers are working very hard to make better. First is time to first plot. This is a major complaint that you still see going around, which is the first time that you want to do something, you, the code is going to be pre-compiled. So if I plot something, all of the plotting library is going to be compiled for the first time that I run my code. And this can be very slow. Uh, in the early days, it will take maybe two minutes to get the, the first plot out of the box. Now it's better depending on your computer, but also people are working uh, intensively on making this a better experience with every new version of Julia. Another not so common complaint, but also more recent, is that you have too much composability, so that makes correctness hard. And what I mean here is that because Julia has so many options, uh, so many different um, things that you can create, sometimes people mix different parts of different codes. They take an internal thing from one code and uh, another thing from another code. So I'm using two different packages. And those packages have no way of always respecting what I'm doing with their packages. So essentially, the same thing that I did for a matrix, I could be doing for a specific type of uh, uh, different package. And I could be mixing it with a function from another package. 
those packages don't know that they are being used that way, so you can't expect them to always work. Another common complaint is that standalone binaries are not easy to generate, so it, I, I, it's not easy to get a setup.exe or a common line interface. I don't have much experience with this, but uh, from what I hear, it's, it's not easy. And of course, you don't have as many mature packages as other languages. Uh, it's new language and most people working with Julia are academics uh, and they are doing like cutting edge research and not uh, pushing uh, packages, right? So you still have a, a large discrepancy comparing to Python, for instance. Another thing is that the development is very different from uh, both compiled and interpreted languages. So the work workflow is not traditional because of that. Uh, and having a, checking the, the uh, doing a performance optimization and debugging is less intuitive because you don't have direct access to the compiled uh, to the compiled code. Uh, and we have garbage collector in Julia, so you have less control of your memory. Lastly, I I've left uh, these slides will be online, so you can always check them. Uh, but I left here uh, some ecosystems that I found. It's not a comprehensive list, but uh, some that I I've heard about and that I think might be interesting for future readers uh, to at least showcase some of the great packages and communities uh, that we have in Julia. I'm uh, not going to go into details because I know I don't have time for it. Uh, the first one is, of course, the one that I've been working for eight years, Julism's Optimizers, for nonlinear optimization and some things related to linear algebra, uh, specifically in the context of optimization of problems. Uh, you also have Jump for mathematical programming. Uh, specifically, the modeling language Jump is... is a uh, major uh, player in Julia land. You have SciML with a lot of things related to scientific machine learning and uh, physics informed machine learning, differential equations, etc. You have uh, a few packages regard, uh, related to plotting, not only plots, but also interesting things like Vegalite and Unicode plots. Uh, Flux for machine learning, uh, for specifically neural networks. You have BioJulia for biology. You have quantum. You have Yao for quantum computing. You have economic modeling, the quantum con environment. Echo for ecological research and Julia Dynamics for nonlinear dynamics, chaos, and also a lot of cool gifs and animations, which I recommend. Uh, these agents uh, see online, I could not make it work here because it's a very large file, but it's very cool. And that was it for me. I hope you enjoyed this talk and enjoy the rest of the webinar.